by some cosmic coincidence, uh, it turns out that I'm going to be talking about the importance of developing those idiosyncratic signatures that Frank Gehry talked about last night, um, because we think it's very critical activity. So the basic abstract of my argument is going to be that, uh, contrary to what Edward uh, Clapp said, Clapp, sorry, sorry, <laughs> said earlier today, and uh, what lots of other people in creativity studies have also argued, we don't believe that creativity is domain specific, but rather that it is problem or challenge specific. And sometimes that means it will be domain specific, but often it means it's going to be across domains or disciplines and so forth. So I don't want to limit it to just domain. Um, that's very important for our argument because we think that creativity presumes the ability to find new problems at these interfaces between different areas and therefore combine disparate skills, methods, and knowledge in new ways. So what that means then is that you'll find that most creative people are trained in multiple disciplines and are therefore polymaths who master more than one set of skills. It may be when during the early training or as Robert Builder got involved in creativity after he was uh, working in brain sciences, you learn it later on. Um, success in STEM subjects, it turns out, is highly associated with arts and crafts avocations. So that was somewhat of a surprise, but quite interesting, and I'll document that. <laughs> Um, but, and here's sort of the downside, um, some disciplines do not reward uh, working in the arts and crafts, but have other mixtures. So arts and crafts are not going to be the panacea for everything. So what we then would conclude is that education for creativity should foster mastery of idiosyncratic mixtures, those individualistic signatures that Frank Gehry talked about uh, in many different disciplines or several different disciplines, and the ability to then transfer or integrate that information, sets of problems, and so forth uh, together. And therefore, the critical thing here is actually uh, practicing the creative process. So just a word about methodology. Uh, we are looking at adults who have already achieved status as creative individuals. They are successful in their careers, whatever their careers turned out to be. Um, we're doing lookbacks at their formal and informal educational experiences, trying to identify critical things that made them different than people who were perhaps less creative or less successful. Uh, looking for statistically significant associations between these professional success and non-professional activities, uh, substantiating these statistics, which obviously are only correlations, with case studies to look at how the individuals actually talk about or use the integrations of the different skills they have, and then testing these with reference to intervention studies, most of which we haven't actually carried out ourselves, but act many of which are in the current literature. Okay, so basically to summarize there, uh, we're trying to do what Mark Runko was worried, or to avoid what Mark Runko was worried about, that you know, we're only gonna look at big C creativity, but what we're trying to do is yes, we're looking at mainly big C creativity, but trying to link it to little c experiences. First slide. Oh, sure, sorry. First slide, please. Um, so one of the critical, studies we've done is uh, looking at Nobel Prize winners, comparing them to various other groups, Royal Society, the National Academy of Sciences, um, members of a, a general scientific organization called Sigma Xi and the general public. Long and short of uh, this basic study is that uh, Nobel Prize winners are much more likely to be engaged in arts and crafts as adults. Um, even while they're doing their Nobel Prize winning work, as it turns out, than are less successful scientists or the average scientist or person in the uh, public. So you can see here, particularly art, 17 times more likely to be active artists as adults, 15 times more likely to be craftsmen, 25 times more likely to be a creative writer, 22 times more likely to be engaged in some performance art, such as acting or something like that. So these are extremely large differences uh, which really set the Nobel Prize winners off from other groups. Um, the Royal Society and National Academy are much more likely to be engaged in these than the average scientist, uh, but less likely than Nobel Prize winners. Next slide. Another type of study we've looked at is the sustained or persistent uh, arts and crafts participation over a lifetime 
uh, with various other groups. In this case, we looked at Michigan uh, engineers. So this is just a random group of people we were, who were willing to respond to our surveys. And again, people from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, which Michelle mentioned earlier. Uh, when we look at these two groups, you can see that those people, the Michigan Ex Engineers, or sorry, Michigan Economic Development Corporation individuals in the black bars are very significantly more likely to be engaged in lots of arts and crafts. Uh, these are the people who are founding companies, uh, having multiple license patents and so forth as compared to the other engineers, all of whom, of course, are successful. They're having good careers, but are not having the same kind of economic impact. So arts and crafts experience has a definable and measurable outcome here. Next slide. Uh, we've also looked at uh, the National uh, Academy of Engineering. And here we actually used an internal control. So these are all people who are in the National Academy of Engineering. So these are people at the very top of their field. They're all extremely successful. But again, when we look at arts and crafts, we can see that you can differentiate between those members of the National Academy who are most likely to have companies, lots of patents from those who don't found companies and have a small number of patents. So again, in terms of certain type of creativity, arts and crafts make a very big difference, even among the most successful people. Next slide. Michelle mentioned we've looked at 225 scientists and engineers. So here we have a fairly random group of scientists, again, all successful, but not at the high levels we've been talking about before. Uh, visual imaging expressed through drawing. Drawing turns out to be a very important uh, activity for these people. Those scientists who draw out their ideas and have the skills to draw or do this as an uh, avocation are much more likely, about three times more likely, to file patent applications, to get licensed patents. They have twice as many published papers and twice as many books. So again, by another set of evaluations, they are uh, more productive than the average person, and you could say in some ways more creative. Now, it's interesting because Michelle mentioned earlier that arts improve STEM learning. Uh, we know from control studies, particularly by Sorby, if you're interested in looking up, look up visualization or imaging and Sorby, S-O-R-B-Y. There are lots of other studies as well, but she's the key person in that field. Um, she has done intervention studies taking kids who are not doing well in STEM subjects anywhere from middle school through college um, and simply given them things like drawing lessons for a year or uh, painting lessons, things like that. All of a sudden, their ability to master their STEM subjects goes up, even though they're getting no different training in their STEM subjects. Um, you can see the same kinds of things in Margaret uh, Bromelsek's work. Um, there are many people who are working on combining arts uh, with medicine, and they're very well-controlled studies showing very, very definite uh, improvements in, in lots of different measures. And just to give you one other interesting example, you literally can't get into dental school today without having at least a year of studio art in college because the dental schools know that if you haven't done that, you don't have the skills to be a dentist. All right, so next slide. Some typical responses that we get from people when we then look at these 225 scientists and say, do you think that arts should be in the standard STEM curriculum or part of the standard education is, you can see here, 80% say absolutely yes, definitely, certainly, things like that. Only about 12% say mm, not really sure, and only about 6% or less say no. So. Scientists recognize the importance of the arts for what they are doing. And these are not the National Academy. These are not Nobel Prize winners. These are just plain old successful scientists. They know these things. Next slide. So here are some of the kinds of things, and well, I won't go through these in detail, but paper folding of wood block play helped me learn geometry. Uh, quilting improves my creativity in my current vocation. This is a scientist. Um, lasers and photonics, my interest in those and ability in those is developed my, by my photography hobby. Mechanical and material properties that I learned from my hobbies actually relate to my mechanical and material issues in microelectronics. These are kinds of detailed information that we're getting from these individuals. Next slide. So 
then when we look again at responses to surveys that we give to these scientists, we find wonderful things. And Michelle showed you this slide earlier, looking at possible worlds and play acting and things like that. Here, if you look at cross-disciplinary work, very, very significant differences between the people who are founding companies and filing patents and things like that in terms of working across disciplines, very, very significant differences in whether they use the knowledge that they get from their hobbies to actually inform their work. So the kinds of things that they're responding on their surveys also get reflected in how they actually go about thinking and doing their work because they think and work interactively. Next slide. So a couple of case studies, we have uh, dozens if not hundreds of these at this point. Um, Alexis Carroll won a Nobel Prize for developing the surgical techniques that allow transplants. He developed the techniques from adapting his skill in lace making, which he learned as a child from his mother, to the stitches. Next slide. Um, this is Dorothy Hodgkin. She won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. By the age of 16, she was already a professional illustrator of archaeological digs, and she said she learned the 2 and 3D uh, symmetry functions from doing those drawings, which was essential for her Nobel Prize winning work in X-ray crystallography. Next slide. Uh, this is Louis de Broglie, another Nobel Prize winner. At the time he was working, one of the theories was that electrons might be conceived of as <coughs> vibrating strings. He was a semi-professional violinist, so immediately he started thinking about if these are vibrating strings, what does that mean? That means they should have harmonics and overtones. So he sat down and said, well, the size of these little strings would be such and such. I can calculate what the overtones and harmonics should be. Calculated them, published them. Everybody thought he was crazy until two, we two years later, somebody actually measured them, which won him his Nobel Prize. Next slide. And here we have Louis Alvarez, a California native. His father looked at his talent. He was a very smart guy, but he loved to be building things and making things. So instead of sending him to the high IQ high school, which was nearby, he sent him to the technical high school to learn how to make things out of wood and metal and so forth, just assuming that he'd be bright enough to learn all the academics on his own. Well, Louis Alvarez got a Nobel Prize by being one of the most creative instrument builders who has ever lived. And I think you can see the connection. Next slide. So the problem here, as I said, is I don't want to hang too much on the arts. All of you should know that Michelle and I are among the most vociferous advocates of arts education. But the arts are not a panacea. Um, as Stephen Tepper pointed out earlier, you don't want to create, make this uh, total uh, equivalence between art and creativity. We really need to understand what the relationship is or might be and put that in the context of what do we do best in educating our children. So we've now looked at other groups beside Nobel Prize winners in the sciences. And you can see here some of the generalized data. You can see that different groups, Nobel Prize winners in literature or peace or economics and so forth, are quite different from each other and quite different from the public. The one thing that comes out of this is all Nobel Prize winners are much more likely to have adult avocations outside their field than is the average uh, person in the US public. Next, next slide. So if we break this down, we can now see some of those differences. And this is where some of the problems come in, in trying to equate creativity with arts. Economists are very likely to have been trained in a science or math or astronomy or something like that before moving into economics. They are very unlike scientists. They have almost no arts and crafts avocations at any time during their lives. But what they do have is a very intense interest in humanity, social sciences, psychology, anthropology, and so forth, which makes perfect sense in terms of what they're going to be doing. They want to understand human behavior and how that impacts through often mathematical and other equations, other things. So like scientists, but not like scientists. Next slide. And here we have Nobel Prize winners in literature. Um, here we see the arts are just as important for the literature people as the scientists. In fact, the probability of a scientist taking up creative writing is about equivalent uh, to a literature person uh, taking up science. And these are actually quite significant uh, avocations. 
But again, the critical difference here is the literature people have very high interests in humanities. And again, that makes sense for the kinds of things that a literature person would do. So different mixes of interests are very important to different people in different fields. Next slide. One final thing that we've also found, um, I'm not going to show you any statistics, and actually you can't see on the left-hand side, we have a Nobel Prize winner uh, climbing a mountain there. It's straight up a cliff, William Chalkley. Uh, lots of Nobel Prize winners, very successful scientists, are extremely active. Um, some of these are group sports, some of them are individual sports. Um, the Bernd Heinrich, who you see running there, is not only a very famous scientist, he's also an artist, and he set several world records for ultra marathoning. So these are often at very high levels of activity. So again, arts aren't the only thing. There are all sorts of skills that you can develop which end up actually being useful in terms of understanding through your body, your emotions, your physical uh, being, and so forth, how things work. Next slide. Oh, that should be last slide. Sorry. Um, so summarize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. So arts and crafts participation across a lifetime is the best predictor that we have found so far for success in STEM subjects. We've shown you some of the reasons why it helps you visualize, imagine, use your body, all sorts of things like this. Um, it's not true for non-STEM subjects. So arts play different roles for, say, people in literature or economics than they do in STEM subjects, and we should be aware that there are different roles that arts can play for different people in different areas. What is generally true is very successful people, no matter where we look at them, have a much higher probability of engaging in multiple different disciplines, either vocationally or avocationally, or changing fields or things like that. So they are mixing their knowledge of problems, methods, skills, and all sorts of things in ways that less successful or less creative people do not do. In other words, to sum up, they have lots of experience, the successful people have lots of experience with creative process. They are constantly learning new things, trying new things, inventing their own challenges, and trying all sorts of new uh, solutions. So general conclusions here is that creativity, in our view, presumes the integration of previously disparate problems, concepts, methods, and or materials. Um, otherwise, you're not going to come up with anything new. It may or may not be effective. Obviously, there's a social component to that because it has to be thrown out there and you have to test it against all the other things and see whether people are willing to, to use it. Specifically, then, any particular creative product or act is going to be problem or challenge determined, just as we talked about, uh, for example, putting lace making together uh, with surgery. Once you've done that, you've done it. That's the creative act. Nobody's going to come up with that same solution again in the same way. You don't need to solve that problem anymore. Creativity, therefore, requires idiosyncratic polymathic ability, uh, which is matched to any particular problem or challenge. And this is the real problem we have in education because we can't foresee all the problems. Part of being creative is inventing new problems. It's discovering things, possibilities that we've never seen before. So there's not going to be any formatable way that we can simply say this is the mix of skills, knowledge, creative ability, whatever it is that our students need because we don't need, know what they need. What they need is the ability to be flexible and to understand how to use knowledge in other forms, in other ways, and to mix and match what they do know to find the right problem that they can solve. So in practice, what this means is going to back to what Frank Geary said last night. We need to figure out ways that we can take everybody's individual signature that makes them them and do our best to foster that idiosyncratic ability and match it up with the right kinds of challenges and the right kinds of possibilities in the right social contexts so that they can be successful. And that's more than just arts, but arts are a definite and very important component of that. Thank you.